My name is Matt Yan Shishin, and I'm a Partner Solutions Architect. I lead the ISV uh, Partner Solutions Architecture team, so the, the people who work with ISV partners. This is always a really fun event for me. It's also a crazy event because the partner ecosystem has grown considerably as well. I've been with AWS about three and a half years. And what's interesting about that relative to this talk is that three and a half years ago, I was like a lot of you guys in the audience today is that I was building my first big data applications. I came from a broadcast uh, video and, and media background, so you know, I could code and I could work with broadcast video workflows and I could deploy clusters to do things like transcoding. But if you said, hey, Matt, go set up a you know, streaming cluster, a streaming data processing cluster, I, you know, my eyes would kind of go like this. And doing a lot of that in the last three and a half years, <laughs> working with a lot of customers, both startups and enterprises, and it's amazing how our portfolio has grown and how our big data ecosystem has grown in this regard. And it's also amazing how easy it is. We're gonna do something fun. It's called a live demo today. So we'll see how we go. I didn't even include screenshots, so if I screw up, you can laugh. But uh, I think it's more fun, and it, really what we're gonna do today is to show you how easy it is to spin up clusters to do data processing, to get into Hadoop, to start using a data warehouse, Amazon Redshift, and even to do complex things like streaming data processing. How many of you were in the keynote this morning? Okay, pretty cool. So Kinesis Firehose came out, which is great because that means I can talk about it. <laughs> and same with QuickSight. So I'll try to integrate some of the new services that came out this morning that are directly applicable to what we're talking about today. But things like streaming data processing, things like BI at scale, running a Hadoop cluster, this is entirely possible and very easy for you to do today. And that's what we're gonna do together. We're gonna build an end-to-end -end big data application. But before we do, I think a lot of people focus too much on the tools. Now I give the Big Data Bootcamp at AWS, and we just gave it on Monday and Tuesday, and I, I notice that a lot of the customers that I meet in these camps, they, they agonize over, should I use Hive, should I use Spark, should I use a data warehouse, what database should I use? Really, it's more about the business problem. And I always tell people to work backwards from the actual business problem you're trying to solve. At the end of the day, big data is not about what tool you use, it's about the value that you can derive from your data. And it's about design patterns that you can represent in any number of ways with third-party solutions in the AWS ecosystem or with AWS native services. The way I like to think about it is data in, data out. And everything in between is just the details. We have a number of services in this space. We have storage services like the object storage service, Amazon S3. We have Kinesis that just launched Kinesis Firehose this morning. Think of Kinesis like a buffer or a queue, a great place to catch inbound streaming data. We have DynamoDB, a managed NoSQL offering that makes running NoSQL databases at scale really easy. And we have this sort of new paradigm emerging with event-based processing, notably with AWS Lambda, responding to changes as they occur. You drop a JPEG into an S3 bucket, you fire off a Lambda function automatically, and it creates a thumbnail. In the big data world, you drop a log file into an S3 bucket, you fire off a Lambda function, and you transform that log into something structured that you can load into a database. Rather than polling, we're starting to move to this event-driven paradigm. But what we're here to talk about most today is the data processing on the right-hand side of this. We're gonna learn how to spin up a Hadoop cluster. We're gonna learn how to spin up a Redshift cluster, a data warehousing cluster. Unfortunately, we don't have time in 56 minutes and 16 seconds to cover machine learning, but there's some great sessions on that today as well. But we are gonna touch on something pretty cool, and I'm gonna put some code on the screen, so warning. I'm gonna put some Scala on the screen. I'm gonna run Scala. And if you are not a programmer, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna show you that even the programming element of this is not difficult. Especially with tools like Kinesis Firehose, it makes that getting data into a system that you can then use to analyze the data really, really easy. But I wanna show you that next step. If you wanna not only get the data in, but you also wanna transform the data as it flows in. And I wanna show you that it's easy. Because just like me three and a half years ago, that first step is kinda of tough. It's intimidating. You're dealing with clusters. And most of us in the back of my minds, we have these painful memories of that guy who set up the data warehousing cluster who lost his mind. Because <laughs> it was really hard a few years ago. The, the guy who set up the Hadoop cluster was never seen again. And I'm gonna show you how just in one command, and by the way, we're gonna use the command line too. You know, I could do pretty console stuff, but let's get, let's get nasty. Let's go in the terminal and let's use the command line to do this. It's more fun and it shows you how you can create a cluster with one single command. Forget clicks. It's easy, so let's do it together. This is what we're gonna build together. Remember I said that don't focus on the tools, focus on the design pattern, and this is a really common design pattern that many of us in the room have. You have logs or maybe sensor data, 
or whatever. It's coming at you at full force. You know, your business is growing, you're doing great. But secretly you're stressing out because there's a lot of data coming at you and you're like, man, how am I gonna process this? This Python script that the intern wrote three years ago just is not scaling. So we're gonna use Kinesis to catch that inbound data. We're gonna persist that data into S3 using Amazon EMR and Spark streaming. And then we're gonna load it into Redshift and then we're gonna visualize it. QuickSight came out today. That's my favorite announcement personally. It's an amazing data visualization and BI engine that you can use with third-party tools or you can use with its own graphical engine on top. But it just came out today and I don't have access to it yet for this demo, so we're gonna use Matt's D3 web visualization, not the fanciest tool. But I think it's relevant because it also shows you that you can build very cost-effective uh, visualization dashboards that help you visualize business problems after you process the data very easily. These slides will be available, and in fact, they're complete. So apologies in advance for a lot of Scala on the screen, but they're designed so that you can take these slides and do it yourself. At the end, I show you how much it would cost you in your personal AWS account to do what we do today, and hopefully you'll be pleasantly surprised. Let's just say it's a single digit. So the first part is collecting. So we have logs on the left. We need to get them into Amazon Kinesis, which again, think of Kinesis like a buffer or a queue, a place to temporarily store your streaming data while you figure out what to do with it. And then we're gonna use something called Spark Streaming. And Spark is a wonderful framework that's become very popular, I'd say, in the last two years. And if you have ever heard of MapReduce or Hadoop, you can run Spark in a variety of ways. Today we're gonna run Spark on Amazon Elastic MapReduce, and that means that we're gonna be running Spark on Yarn. Yarn is really just the resource manager, the tool that takes care of distributing work across a cluster, so you don't have to figure out how to run that intern Python script on a bunch of servers, it does that part for you. And Spark Streaming is one of the components or modules of Spark that is specifically for handling inbound streaming data. So we're gonna use Spark Streaming to reach into Kinesis, to pull data out of the Kinesis stream, to transform it just a little bit to show you how you would do real-time data transformation, and then finally to persist it to S3. I chose Spark Streaming, and I could have written a Kinesis client library, or I could have used another framework. I could have done it manually myself, but Spark Streaming is powerful and simple, and it gives you sort of a unified platform that you can use with Python, or you can use even Spark SQL if you prefer SQL and you don't want to code. It's a great framework that makes big data accessible and yet powerful and scalable. Then we're gonna process the data. We're gonna do some processing with uh, Spark. You're gonna see Spark in action. There's a difference between Spark streaming, which is taking the streaming data out and manipulating it, and then Spark, which actually does the in-place data processing. Then once we process the data and re-persist the transformed data, we do some, basically, ETL. We persist it back on S3, and then we load from S3 into Redshift, and we use Redshift as a data warehouse that we can point Tableau to, or Tibco Jaspersoft, or MicroStrategy, or whatever your data visualization tool of choice is to and show that pretty picture. Because at the end of the day, what are we here for? Not to tell people about Hadoop, it's to show that pie chart to the CFO. That's what really matters. It's to solve a business problem. It's to present the data in a way that makes the data valuable. So let's do it. So first step is to set up the AWS command line tool. And we're gonna switch to console here. So AWS command line tool, that's kind of hard to see. <laughs> That's okay. AWS command line tool is a very powerful tool. It's simple, uh, but it can be used with an, a large number of services. And we're going to be using it today to launch clusters, to create S3 buckets, to create Kinesis streams. And the reason why I use the command line tool is because if you get used to the command line tool, then it's one step further to being able to use the SDK and programming. And it's also something that you can script. So what we do today, you could potentially automate by scripting a lot of these commands. It's, it's harder to script clicks on the management console, right? So the first thing we're gonna do with the command line tool is to create a Kinesis stream. We have to create a location where we can push our streaming data. So let's use the command line tool to create a stream. And a stream is really just, again, think of it like a queue or a buffer, and you can add and remove capacity, the ability to ingest at the scale that you need to ingest and also read and write from it by the number of shards in your stream. We're gonna create a single shard stream, which is more than enough for this demo. So let's take this one line command. There we go. So I created a, a stream. 
And this is pretty amazing. If you've ever set up, for example, like a Kafka cluster or any kind of a, you know, stream to capture data, you know that it doesn't take one command in two seconds. <laughs> and so what's interesting about this example, too, is I did a single shard stream, but I could have done a hundred shard stream to handle an enormous amount of big data. I was joking yesterday that if, you know, I wrote a game and suddenly Taylor Swift started playing with it and tweeted about it, I better have a system ready to capture all of the in-game events at scale when that happens. Next thing we're going to do is create an Amazon S3 bucket. Now, S3, you can think of it like a just super scalable file system. In reality, it's an object file storage system. You can put anything in S3. It's a great place to store all your data because it's highly, highly durable, and it's very cost-effective. It's extremely inexpensive to store a lot of data in S3. So we're going to use Kinesis as that temporary, think of it like a scalable staging area where we push the streaming data. And then we're going to pull the data out, but we're going to persist it for the long term in S3. One great advantage of S3 is that it works with a lot of different products, a lot of different frameworks. So if I have S3 as kind of the center of my data universe, then I can use Spark Streaming, I can use Presto, I can, use, I can load into Redshift. It's a great place to put your data because multiple tools can read and write to S3, and importantly, multiple tools in parallel. Many of us work in big companies, and big companies, you'll know, might have different BI units or different affiliates, and you know, the business, the, the big data people in the white lab coats who actually write the algorithms, they may have their tool of choice. And it's important to give people flexibility. So if you have your data in S3, then you, they can use a variety of tools to access that data without having to create multiple copies of the data. So if you think of a database, if they want to use different databases, you'd have to have different databases and copies of the data, wasting storage space and money. Whereas if you use S3 in a framework like Spark or Hive or anything that can talk to S3, then you can have one copy of the data and multiple tools talking to it. So let's make a bucket. A bucket is just a place in S3. Think of it like a file folder where we're going to stick data. And hopefully the name isn't taken. Oh, someone already took that. So we'll call it two. Great. Next, what we're going to do is create a cluster. Now, what I did so far, you know, some people are like, wow, slow clap. But now we get into the cool stuff. We're going to create a Hadoop cluster. And for a lot of people, this is the intimidating part when you're starting with big data. I'm going to create a, and this, what am I doing? A two node EMR cluster, an elastic MapReduce cluster. That's a managed Hadoop cluster. And I like to think about Hadoop a bit like a, an operating system for big data. It used to be that Hadoop was primarily a distributed file system called HDFS and a data processing framework called MapReduce, which is really a way to distribute work around a cluster and process it. But Hadoop has evolved a lot, and EMR has evolved with it. So Hadoop 2 has something called Yarn, and Yarn, think of it like the coach. It's a resource manager that distributes work around a cluster. But on top of Yarn, you can have a number of different applications running in parallel. So you can have a, a SQL application called Hive that uses HiveQL to do like select star for my data in S3, for example. You can have Pig is another popular framework. Spark is very popular. Think of these like applications on your operating system. So many of you may use Linux or have used Linux, and Linux has something called distributions. So there's Debian, there's Red Hat, there's CentOS, there's all these distributions. All these distributions are somewhat similar, um, but they have different packaging formats. Hadoop is really kind of the same thing. There's different Hadoop distributions, and EMR supports both the MapR commercial distribution and our own distribution, which is pretty much the same as Apache Hadoop. And then on top of these distributions, you can run Hadoop applications that run on Yarn that takes care of distributing the work that they do out to the cluster. And one of these applications is Spark. We're going to use Spark and Hive today. And what Hive gives you is, is a convenient way to express SQL commands. And so you can write the SQL that you've always written, pretty much. And it takes that SQL and translates it into MapReduce jobs or Tez jobs or whatever execution engine Hive is sitting on top of. Today, we're going to be using Spark SQL. And Spark SQL, similarly, you write SQL, and then it goes off and bins off a, a Spark job. You don't have to know Java. You don't have to know Scala. You don't have to know Python. You can write as you always have, and it takes care of the heavy lifting under the cover. So there's a lot of frameworks, and you can go as deep as you want with Hadoop. So again, we're going to use the command line to spin up a cluster. And again, this is designed to be taken home and tried on your own time. There. Now let's just think about this for a second. 
And I'll show you on the console so you don't think I'm faking it. <laughs> I just spun up a Hadoop cluster, and I did a two node simple cluster because I wanted to actually spin up in time for this demo because I have 44 minutes and 47 seconds left. It's going to spin up in about two, three minutes. This could have been a 100 node cluster. If you had uh, expanded your limits ahead of time with AWS, this could have been a 1,000 node cluster. This could have been a 10,000 node cluster. We have customers regularly running th multi thousand node clusters to do their jobs. And this is incredible. Again, think back to that guy who was never seen again four years ago who, who built your Hadoop cluster on premises. It's, it was not one command in a minute. Not only is it provisioning the cluster, it's going off and it's installing Spark. It's installing those applications that you need to do your, business, or your, your big data processing as well. So it's taking care of all of that heavy lifting because in this room, very few of us are getting paid for spinning up clusters. We're getting paid for analyzing the data and the insights that we derive from them. So again, we like to say at Amazon, you know, it gets rid of undifferentiated heavy lifting. It's a bit of a mouthful. It gets rid of the muck that is really not core to most of our jobs. So let's look at the console and make sure that Matt's not lying. Hopefully that's big enough for you guys to see. We'll go to EMR. I do have a cluster that I spun up for Strata conference last week. Oops. I guess I spun it up in the other, other environment. One second, let me get to my other environment. We'll wait to that. There we go. while we wait for the Wi-Fi. Big data is fast, so sometimes conference Wi-Fi is a little slow. There it is. So demo reinvent, if you were paying attention, is the one we just spun up. And I have one that I spun up for Strata last week, just in case. But uh, we'll come back to this in a couple minutes so you can see how that cluster will be fully provisioned and running. OK, so two minutes, we have a Hadoop cluster spun up. Now let's start up a Redshift cluster, so data warehouses. There was another guy who lost his mind, remember, who set up a data warehouse on premises a few years ago? Data warehouses are notoriously complex, slow, and hard to manage. They solve a big data business problem, but uh, there's a really good reason why we came out with Amazon Redshift is because uh, they're particularly hard to tune, they're hard to deploy, and just like Hadoop, they're typically a large cluster that is an operational uh, burden for many companies. So Redshift is a fully managed data warehouse, and again, to spin up a Redshift cluster, one command. We're going to do a single node cluster today, but this could easily be a multi-node cluster. And this isn't a full session on Redshift, but long story short, Redshift is a columnar data warehouse. So it's, think of it like a database that's optimized for analytics. A lot of people get confused by the difference between columnar and a traditional relational database. And what it really boils down to is if you think of like a user profile when you log into a website or to a mobile application, usually if you pull the user profile table or a row from the user profile, you need most, if not all, of the columns to populate the UI, you know, the name, the profile picture, all this other stuff. Whereas if it's a column data warehouse and a typical analytics query, it's something like select star from AWS employees who like the Maple Leafs. And there's only a few, one of whom is Matt. But the point is, is I didn't need all of the columns in the employee database to answer that question. So Redshift arranges its data on disk in columnar format. So I only need the names of the employee and their favorite hockey team and then I can just do a, ask those two columns for the information that I need to answer my question. And Redshift can very quickly descend into those columns and pull out the information it needs instead of having to scan every single row. So it's column-based instead of row-based. It's a columnar data warehouse. It does a lot of other stuff under the covers, like encryption, and it, it does uh, great compression, and, and many other things that makes it run quickly for billions and billions of rows. But it's a great tool for analytics-style queries, if you're using SQL, and if you have tools that need to use, need to connect to it with JDBC and ODBC. It works with all of your existing tools. So let's spin up that cluster. Oops, I already spun up that one. Let's do another one. What should we call it? Demo awesome. Oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry. I get pumped up by the uh, keynote. 
That should be fine. There. So sorry that took, you know, 23 seconds instead of 10. <laughs> Here we have the output, and again, I'll show you on the console in a second that we have a data warehouse that will spin up in just a couple minutes and will be available for us to use before the end of the session. Okay, so I'm feeling pretty good. I spun up a Hadoop cluster, I spun up a data warehouse, I spun up a Kinesis stream, I created an S3 bucket, all in about, you know, less than 20 minutes. So let's, let's go back to what we're actually going to do. So we're going to collect the data. What we're going to do is we're going to fake it. Um, in terms of getting data into our stream, we're going to use uh, log4j, or rather a jar file, to push Apache HTTP server logs into our Kinesis stream. Then we're going to process those logs with Amazon EMR, and then we're going to analyze them finally with Redshift. So first step is to uh, download a jar, and I've already done this, so I'm not going to do it, but it's just a simple demo program that has uh, Apache log files, or rather log entries, and it's going to push those automatically into our Kinesis stream, just to have some data, some real data to play with. These are just instructions, and I included them in the slide so you have them when you take them home, on how to uh, set up the program so you can push some data into your Kinesis stream. And importantly, this is what the log file looks like. And look at this, because these are, this is the data that we're going to grab. And some important characteristics about this data is that we don't necessarily need all of the data. This is a very simple example, very simple log file. If any of you have ever worked in advertising or marketing, you'll know that uh, Omniture logs, for example, have a lot more columns than this. And typically, the questions that we need to answer to solve our business problems don't need all of those columns. So one thing we're going to do today in our streaming data program is do field extraction. When we go and grab these log lines from the stream, we're only going to pull out or we're going to extract the data that we need to actually load into the data warehouse. That's going to be part of our ETL process. So if you're familiar with Apache HTTP server, this will be no news to you, just a standard log. Again, we're going to use Spark. So Spark is a fast, general-purpose uh, data processing engine. And you can think of it kind of as a new and improved MapReduce. So MapReduce is one framework, one way of distributing uh, data processing work around a cluster. Spark has a lot of improvements over uh, traditional MapReduce. Namely, it uses memory and other techniques to more quickly and efficiently use your cluster to process data. The nice thing about Spark 2 is it has, a, it has a machine learning framework, it has a graph framework, it has a streaming framework, so it kind of gives you a unified platform to do various different types of data processing. And this is a little bit more of a detailed view of how we're going to do the data processing, so we're going to push that data into Kinesis, then we're going to use Spark Streaming to pull it out. Now, interestingly, Spark Streaming behind the scenes actually has a Kinesis library, and it uses our Kinesis client library under the covers to interact with Kinesis. So just if you were to write your own custom Kinesis application, you can use Spark Streaming as a higher level framework, and it, under the cover, it uses the Kinesis client library. Importantly, it also uses DynamoDB via the Kinesis client library to keep track of things. Because what happens if you're processing that stream, and then you, know, you fat finger it and you shut down your cluster by accident, or you pause the streaming processing? How do you know where to pick up again? Or if you have multiple applications reading from the stream, you need some form of checkpointing. You need to be able to keep track of what has been processed. And that's why DynamoDB is used on the back end. It's kind of your source of truth. What messages have I touched? What logs have I processed? Where do I need to start again if things get interrupted? And then Spark Streaming will then persist it and push it back to S3. So let's log into our cluster. First of all, we're going to start pushing to the um, stream. One second. Okay, great. So that was, I just fired off a Java application that's going to start pushing records into the stream. So this is, in real time, we're now writing to our Kinesis stream. So we're simulating streaming data. We're pretending that we had a fleet of servers running Apache HTTP server, and that we're pushing the logs in real time to the Kinesis stream. That's what that's doing. Now we're going to log into our EMR server. That's a little messy. Let's do another one. Okay. So we're going to log into our EMR server. There we are. So we've SSH'd into our EMR server. The first thing we need to do is download the Kinesis client, because remember, the 
The Spark streaming application uses the Kinesis client to go uh, do checkpointing and also to reach into the Kinesis stream. And I think I've already done this, but we'll double check. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I did already do it. And then we're going to launch the Spark shell. Now, there are some graphical interfaces for Spark, and there's some partners we have in the ecosystem that provide a nice kind of um, easy way to interact with Spark, but we're going we're gonna to go deep, and we're going to do it using the shell and actually in the console to show you how, uh, you know, how, how the pros do it. And there should be no difference from how you do it and the pros do it. It's, it's a very easy line to cross. So the Spark shell, think of it like a terminal, like a shell, and it allows you to, um, in real time, sort of program Spark applications. And we're going to use Scala. There's also a Python Spark shell. So you can, if you've ever used Python, there's a Python shell that you can launch, and you can sort of in real time code Python and figure out, you know, how you're messing up commands when it gives you errors in real time instead of having to write the whole program and then run it. Same kind of concept. Now, you might be asking yourself, if you paid attention today in the uh, keynote, why not just use Kinesis Firehose? It's a good question. If your sole aim is to push the data into Redshift for analysis, then Firehose is actually probably the best choice. It's a really easy way to push data via Kinesis into S3 or into Redshift for analysis. The reason why I'm using Spark Streaming today and why I didn't change it for Firehose this morning after the announcement is because we're doing one extra step. We're manipulating the data on the way. So as we pull it out of the stream, we're, we're doing some field extraction and some transformation, and we're structuring or ordering the data. So imagine you had a bunch of different logs from different HTTP servers that don't have the same format. Imagine some of these HTTP servers occasionally kind of mangled their logs. We would need some kind of a streaming framework that could take all of these different log formats and account for some of the errors that are occasionally introduced into the log files and normalize them into a structured format that can then go into your data warehouse. And that's what streaming frameworks are really good for. So now we get to the Scala. Are you ready? And again, all of the code that you need is in these slides. And it's not much. It's like two or three slide stops. And even if you don't code, don't go to sleep now. You can follow this. So let's look at it. So first of all, it's the easy part. We're just importing some libraries that we need our program to be aware of or to, to have loaded such that it can understand how to read from the Kinesis stream and persist stuff to S3 and do some processing. So let that import. Nothing, nothing fancy here. The next thing we do is it's pretty simple stuff. We say, hey, I'm going to point to a stream called access log stream. That was that Kinesis stream that created in that first step. That's where our data has been pushed. Remember, there was all the log files being pushed into the stream? That's it. The second thing is, uh, what region are you in? And where do you want to persist this stuff? What S3 bucket do you want to be the destination after you do that pulling it out of the stream and transforming it? And then there's just a couple lines to configure the Spark, what's called the Spark context, and that is what actually runs the application. And then the last thing you need to do, and this is it, is, uh, is actually read this stuff from the stream and then persist it to S3. So these few lines of code, the first one determines how many shards do you have in the stream, how much capacity have you added to your Kinesis stream. So if there's multiple shards, that means you can ingest and also read more data, but the program needs to know to go read from those multiple shards. And then create a worker per stream. So this is a fully scalable application. I did one stream today, but if I did 50, the code as is would auto-scale. We may need a bigger cluster if we have a lot more data coming in. But this code, as written, will scale to your big data needs. So I encourage you to take the code and take this code and to try and expand it, to try and push more data at it, and to watch it scale. It'll add more workers depending on the size of the stream that is capturing your streaming data automatically. So we can see the program is working because it just said one. So yes, that's correct. I have a one shard in my stream. And now let's actually fire off the program. And this last part that I just did is this. And all this does is kicks it off. It says it's a little bit of logic. And this is my crazy transformation that I did. So the ETL, the data transformation, is just in the middle there. Um, it's just going to output using a simple date format to S3. But in that center block there, 
where it says write each RDD, that's just Spark's representation of data, to S3, that's where you would add your data processing logic. So a lot of the other lines you can just copy, forget about it, someone else wrote them, it works. But that middle part, in Python or Spark, or I'll show you in a SQL in a bit, that's where you add your data processing logic. Say you need to transform some text value inside the logs, that's where it goes. So if you're expanding this program, you drop it into that block, you know what your data looks like coming in, and you know what your data has to look like coming out, so you write a little bit of code to do that transformation. And that's it. So it's gonna pull out of the Kinesis stream, transform it, and persist it to S3. It should be working. Great. Now this actually works on a uh, sort of a, a window. So what it does is I think it's set to 60 seconds by default, but it pulls some data from the stream, and every 10 seconds persists to S3. Maybe every 60 seconds, whatever it is in the code there. And that way it batches it a little bit. Because rather than write a million little log files to S3, it bundles up little chunks in a window that you define and persists it to S3. Let's look at that data. So by the way, the, re the Hadoop cluster is up. See, it says waiting, that means it's waiting for you. It's ready to go. And let's look at that Redshift cluster. It's also up. So remember Demo Awesome? <laughs> so we have a Redshift cluster, a, a data warehouse, and a Hadoop cluster fully provisioned and ready for jobs. Let's look at the, uh, the S3 bucket. I was writing to reinvent too, right? There we go. So it's not empty. Did you see me do a command to push stuff into S3 and try to fake it? No, because I didn't. It's working. We have a streaming application using Hadoop, pulling data from a Kinesis queue that we pushed during this class, doing some kind of basic transformation. In this case, I'm not doing much, to be fair, and pushing it into S3. So I know that seemed like sort of a blur of Scala, but it wasn't that complicated, was it? We, and we've set up a fully end-to-end -end streaming data processing application now. Now what's the next step? Because this isn't going to do us much, is it? <laughs> you show this to your CFO, and be like, what is that? You, you, we need to get to that bar chart, right? We need to get to that final step. How do we actually take this process data and make sense of it? Well, the answer is we want to query against it, right? We want to be able to execute analytics queries, and then as an extension of that, we want to visualize the data in some way. So that's the fun part. Well, maybe some of you think the terminal part is the fun part. I don't know, I do. But other, other people want to see some fun stuff on the screen, so let's do that. So we just saw the, the files. Okay, so we're going to do two approaches. We're going to query the data that we have persisted in S3 using two different frameworks. We're, we're going to use Spark SQL to query the data directly in S3, and then we're going to load the data into Redshift and use Redshift to query it. Now, a lot of people ask me in the big data boot camps and elsewhere, if I can use Spark SQL or Hive or Impala or Presto to query my data using SQL with my Hadoop cluster, what do I need Redshift for? Good question. The answer is really Redshift is designed to be a well-oiled machine for one purpose only, and that's for data warehousing, for executing SQL statements against billions and billions of rows. It's a highly tuned, highly optimized, enterprise-grade data warehouse. EMR is an enterprise-grade Hadoop framework, but it does a lot of things. And a lot of these frameworks, like Spark SQL, they're pretty new. They're pretty new. You know, they've only been around. If anyone was here last year, people were still talking about Shark. Shark is gone, and now there's Spark SQL. It's that new. And in terms of query latency, what I usually tell people is that if you're doing exploratory analytics, if you don't know what your data looks like, or you don't know what your big analytics queries are going to look like, things like Spark SQL or Presto or Impala running on Hadoop are great because they can query data on S3 directly and you can kind of explore your data. And with Spark SQL, it's gotten pretty fast. Hive used to take like 20 minutes to run one SQL query on a relatively small amount of data. Some Hive queries of customers I've talked to take multiple days to run. Things have gotten a lot faster with Spark and other frameworks like Tez and elsewhere. So now you can run Spark SQL like we'll see and have responses back in a few seconds. But typically, Redshift will give you faster performance on large data sets because it's structured, it's optimized, um, it's just generally a better choice for a lot of these enterprise data warehouses. That said, your mileage may vary, so give it a shot. 
I like to use both. I like to use EMR for exploratory analytics for data processing, and I like to use Redshift for sort of once the data is structured and for doing the, the white lab coat style hardcore data analytics. So we're going to use both today. So a reminder, Spark SQL is just a module, part of sort of the Spark family. And it allows you to write SQL statements that get translated into Spark jobs. So you don't need to learn Scala like I just showed you. You don't need to learn Python. You can do the select star from Matt like you always have. And it gets auto-translated into a Spark job that gets distributed and run on the cluster. So I'll show you what that looks like. Again, on the EMR cluster, oh, this has worked, so we'll, we'll cancel it. So just like the Spark shell, where you can run Python or Scala in a shell, which, by the way, you wouldn't do, I mean, this is a demo. You would actually pre-write the Spark job and then submit it. There's a Spark submit or APIs you can use. But for demo purposes or for testing, the shell is great. But like the Spark shell, there's a Spark SQL shell. And instead of writing Scala, we're going to write SQL, right? <laughs> you guessed it. So first of all, we have to tell Spark, where is this data? Now, I said something actually mind-blowing, but uh, I kind of said it pretty quickly, is that you can use Spark SQL and other frameworks like Hive to access data and process data directly on S3. This is super significant. You don't need to copy the data into the cluster. The data resides on S3. It uses something called EMRFS. So again, you can have arbitrary data sitting on S3. And think of Hive or Spark SQL as pointers. So when I create a table in Spark SQL or create a table in Hive, I'm not creating a table like in, in a database or in a data warehouse that I load data into. I'm creating a reference of what the data looks like somewhere else. So by creating a table, I'm saying the, these Apache logs that we just persisted into S3 have these values in them that correspond to these columns. So when you go to query, this is what you should expect. When you go to reach out to S3 to go grab that data, this is what it's going to look like. So think of it like a pointer or a representation of data that is stored elsewhere. And there's no need to copy the data in. It's called schema on read. It means that you effectively define what the data is going to look at at query time. And this is incredibly powerful, because in businesses, we have all sorts of different type of data all sorts of different type of log formats. And imagine the power if you had a database that could morph on demand. You know, oh, oh, the data changed. We added a new column. How many times does that happen? And the need to copy the data in another table in another database. You don't have to do that with this. You can just create a new table definition. The data stays in the same place. And if the data has changed shape, you just change the schema and then issue your queries, and it works. So in practice, what does that look like? Well, let's create a table. I'll make this a little bigger. So I've created an external table, and that means that the data is located, you guessed it, externally. And if you look at the last line there, it says location. That's where my data is. So the columns there, host, user, request, and that regular expression, that is just representing what the data looks like on S3, what those files are, what those logs are that we persisted to S3 look like. This is what we just did. So again, an external table with a location pointing to your S3 bucket. And then let's query. And this SQL, for those of you who have ever used a database, is going to be, well, really familiar. You can run regular SQL, except what this is doing when you run the SQL, it's going out to S3 and querying the data directly. So this isn't some database where we've copied data, a very powerful um, framework. Let's do that. There we go. So what did I fetch there? Well, that looks like an Apache log, right? Except it's sitting in a table. So I've actually reached into S3 and pulled out one line. I just did a count of one or a limit of one for my access logs. But this looks, uh, and this could have been a transformed or manipulated version of the Apache log that I transformed on the way in with Spark Streaming. As it happens with my application, I didn't do much transformation, so it looks pretty much the same. But the point is, is it works. I'm using Spark SQL as an engine to read data on S3. And Spark SQL's fast. If I had billions and billions and billions of records on S3, it would still only take a few seconds if I have an appropriately sized cluster to execute SQL statements against them. So I'm doing analytics. We're doing analytics against data in S3 from streaming data that we have processed and pulled from a Kinesis stream. 
Okay, so that's Spark SQL in about two minutes. <laughs> but what, you know, I do some analytics, I, I run some queries, I figure out what my data looks like, and then I decide, okay, now I need to move it into Redshift so I can hook Tableau or whatever onto it and start to do the hardcore stuff. So you maybe do some additional data processing. Redshift is a structured database, so unlike uh, Spark SQL or Hive, it needs to have structure. And in other words, the, da the data needs to correspond to the columns as they are defined in the table in your database. So once we've sort of cleaned up our data and structured it and chunked it into files in S3, then we can load those files into Redshift. We can create a table in Redshift and then load the files in. So let's do that. Now Redshift, as opposed to uh, EMR with Spark SQL, has the storage is coupled with the nodes. So what, like you just saw with EMR, the storage is over here on S3 and the compute processing was on EMR. This is very powerful because historically we have sized our Hadoop cluster for storage. I, can't, I meet a ton of people who, they, they're very worried about, you know, I have 200 terabytes of big data, and so that means I have to buy X number of servers to have a Hadoop cluster that has an HDFS file system that is 200 terabytes or more big. But when you think about it, you're not spinning up a Hadoop cluster to store stuff. That's sort of a secondary concern. You're spinning up a Hadoop cluster to do data processing. That's what it's for, right? So why are you sizing your cluster for storage? So by decoupling storage from compute, it gives you the freedom to tune and size your cluster for your compute needs, not for your storage needs. S3 has effectively unlimited storage. So I can put as much data as I want on S3, and all I have to worry about is how fast I want my queries to run by sizing my cluster accordingly, because the storage is decoupled from the compute. Now again, in a lot of cases, having this storage coupled with the compute, like in Redshift, can result in some better performance, and I was talking about this earlier. For certain types of analytics workloads, you'll, you'll see better performance for hardcore analytics queries when using Redshift as opposed to, say, Spark SQL with EMRFS on EMR. So for SQL-based analytics queries, the storage comes back to the compute. So we need to move that data into the cluster because it can't live on S3. You can't use Redshift to query data on S3. We have to move the data into Redshift. So let's do that. Are we, are we, sorry, we already did this. So first of all, let's connect to the Redshift cluster. Now I'm gonna be nerdy and use the Postgres command line. <laughs> uh, but you could use SQL Workbench J. If you're a Windows user, there's a wonderful tool, tool by a partner of ours called uh, Aginity Workbench for Redshift. If you're a Mac user, there's a nice tool called Postico. Any SQL client that can uh, either use the Amazon Redshift uh, driver and speak JDBC or ODBC, or use the, in some cases, certain versions of the Postgres driver, will work with Redshift. And this is an important characteristic about Redshift, is that your existing tools, for the most part, just work out of the box with Redshift. In this case, again, to be nerdy, I'm gonna use the psql, just the Postgres command line client to connect to my Redshift cluster. Oops, I better get out of the Hadoop cluster. There, I'm connected to my Redshift cluster. Now we need to create a table to house the data. This is gonna look very familiar if you've ever done any SQL. Oh, I'll drop it. There, I just created a table. I'll just remind myself what the bucket is called. I'll do the bucket. I have a bucket filled with a lot more stuff. There we go. So now I'm gonna copy from a bucket uh, that was running with Kinesis for a lot longer, so it has some more logs so we can do some more interesting queries. But this could be the bucket that you just saw with the access logs, and I'm gonna load those processed access logs into Redshift. So I'm gonna do a copy command, and what the copy command does on Redshift is it loads data in parallel from S3, and the key word here is parallel. I was joking that I wanted to get a t-shirt made that say, ABP, always be parallelizing. <laughs> it's so important for everything in Amazon, and especially things like Redshift. The nice thing about Redshift and what makes it so fast for both data load and data unload is that it leverages all of the compute nodes of the cluster, and inside each compute node you have this notion called slices, and each slice can load independently. 
So you can have multiple slices and multiple servers all loading data in parallel from Redshift or from S3. And what this means in a simpler terms is that it's very fast to load large amounts of data into and out of Redshift. So the fact that the compute is coupled with the storage in Redshift is no big deal because if your data is on S3, you can get it into Redshift very fast. If you need to get it into Redshift faster, just add more nodes. Because the more nodes you have, the faster your ingest is going to be because the more slices and nodes you have to load in parallel from S3. <laughs> so we wait until we copy from S3. Let's get back to the slides for a second. So again, we created a table to hold the data in Redshift. And we use the copy commands to load those files in parallel from S3. And then we're going to run some queries. Great. So we just loaded 81,000 rows. Not much for a data warehouse, but still significant for a, you know, a single teeny tiny data warehouse. Now, if I had a very large data warehouse, that could have been 81 million or 8 billion. And again, if you had sized your cluster accordingly, you could have loaded it just as fast if you had enough compute nodes to do that kind of parallel loading. So with those 81,000 rows, let's finish today by doing some queries. There we go. What is this? This is value. I have now taken streaming data, I have taken logs, and now I'm executing SQL statements and get them to solve real business problems. And I'll give you one, a very simple one. I have a really big website, and I'm serving up a lot of 404 errors. And you know what? That costs me money, because my 404 error has this really awesome picture on it, and I have that's data transfer charges, and over the month when Taylor Swift tweets about my new mobile application, suddenly I have 4 billion users, and that 404 page is actually costing me a lot of money. So why am I getting a 404 page? What, what, what is missing? on my web server or my website. So let's use an analytics query to figure that out. How many 404s do I have in this data set? Let's just check. A lot, 2,000. For an 81,000 logs, so 2,000 out of 81,000 are 404s. That's not good. I, I, I got to find a new web designer. Let's find the top ones. Who's the offender? Ooh, I missed a fav icon. I always do that. <laughs> Now, this actually wouldn't cause much data transfer problems, but there, we solved the problem. In real time here, using streaming analytics, we solved the problem. Why am I getting so many 404 errors clogging up my logs? There we go. Now, again, you show this to your CFO, they'll be like, what is that black screen? Why are you showing me this? So let's do something pretty. Now, now you guys have QuickSight now, or Will, and I think they said it's going to come out in preview in a month. That's amazing. So you'll be able to do some really pretty graphs. Um, today, let's use Matt's not quite as pretty graph to, do, to show this. Now, oops, make this bigger so you can actually see it. What's interesting about this is that this is a static website hosted on S3. And a lot of you may have dashboards that you've written. And these dashboards typically are served up by application servers, and you have web front ends and application servers and databases in the back end. What I'll show you now is admittedly a very simple example. But this website would probably cost me, I think, four to six cents a month to host. Why? Because it's hosted on S3. It's just all client side. It's just HTML and JavaScript. And what this little website does is when I hit query, there's no application server. It goes off and fires a Lambda function. Lambda function goes and talks to Redshift, gets the data it needs, returns the data to the web browser of the user, and then uses Plottable, which is a library that sits on top of uh, D3, to render the data. So by using very powerful JavaScript frameworks like D3, and the fact that our web browsers and our mobile devices are now way more powerful than my computer from three years ago is something that you can leverage. So ask yourself, do I need that application server? This is a preview for some sessions later in reInvent about serverless architectures or zero-tier architectures and event-driven computing. Maybe I can use a Lambda function instead of an application server. Maybe I can use a client-side data, visualiz data visualization library to render my pretty graphs. So I don't want to get too off topic. I just want to plant a seed, because it's a theme you'll see at reInvent this time. And what I'm going to do when I hit query here is query that same Redshift table and answer that same problem, you know, what are my top 404 errors in my web logs? And bang. No application server. Hit Redshift. And very clearly and easily, 
an analyst who knows nothing about Hadoop and who doesn't want to see a black screen can very easily understand the data. So we have succeeded. We've taken streaming data coming in from our web logs. We've processed it. We've done some exploratory analytics to figure it out. We've loaded it into Redshift for the actual analytics queries, and we've bolted on a visualization layer so it can make sense to mortals. And we've done it. So thank you with, together for building this application with me. These slides will be available by the end of the week, and I strongly encourage you to try it yourself. And why? Because it's not going to cost you much. This whole end-to-end -end architecture, everything we did today, would cost you about two bucks and 44 cents. That's probably the least expensive big data processing pipeline I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I would have got a big promotion in my last job if I'd gotten a Hadoop cluster for that much. Remember, everything we did today is pay as you go. So that data processing I did to solve that business problem, when that problem is solved, you shut it off. And you don't pay for it anymore. So I encourage you to take this. If you can afford the $2.44, try it yourself, extend it, write a Spark streaming application. Even if you've never touched Scala before and never touched Python before, it doesn't matter. You can figure this out. It's super easy. Take that first step, just like I did three and a half years ago, and you'll be a big data pro in no time. So thanks for your time today. Hope you enjoyed the ride. Have a good show. <laughs>